Uh, I'll check the chat here. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So let's get started. Well, let's just wait one more minute because I think we have a few other people joining. But but as, as we're getting started, I'll say um, uh, we had um, uh, first of all apologies if you were roused from uh, you know slumbers uh, just a little a little while ago. Um, uh, we were talking about the history of time zones and um, time changes, daylight savings time as a standardizing technology that um, still to this day occasionally goes goes awry. So um, uh, uh, we, we were, I don't know if you're even aware, we were, we were all joined um, the call uh, an hour ago, um, but apparently the time, time shift here and daylight savings time mixed up um, um, the appointment schedules, uh, I don't know, on, on someone's end. So uh, we had an interesting mm -hmm. conversation about that. And, I'll confess, I felt I felt badly about any um, um, effort that that uh, Francis was making from your office, who has been nothing but professional, supportive, and and fantastic. Um, I hope uh, I hope she um, um, didn't rouse you from uh, slumbers. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I woke up. Um, I think uh, half an hour before. Uh, checked that uh, an item from my calendar moved uh, downward, <laughs> like one hour, <laughs> and and I. I, I really didn't think much of it so it didn't affect me personally but i saw that uh, it affect all of you uh so um yeah i guess this is delayed gratification or something uh, we'll, we'll right. see yeah. all right we've got the link there in the chat um to slido so why don't we go ahead and get started so uh, minister tang thank you so much for uh making some time to join this this, this class uh, at stanford university on ethics and policy of technological change um, we're in the last week of the quarter here, so the students um, have gone through nearly the entirety of the course. And um, there's a team that teaches the class. I am a philosopher. I bring an ethical lens. There's a public policy or social scientist, my colleague Jeremy Weinstein, and then a computer scientist, my colleague Maron Sahami. So three different perspectives brought to bear in the course. Um, as a philosopher, I want to start off in introducing you by saying um, that I am um, uh, probably, you know, more oriented towards a kind of Socratic orientation, both in the class and in the discussions we have with guests. But today, uh, with you, I have to confess or or gush in a way. Um, you you serve for me as a as a kind of modern day hero, or at least a role model um, of sorts, in that you have taken the extraordinary technical talents that you've acquired and deployed them for civic rather than um, money making purposes directly found ways to um, use technology um, in the way that Stanford so so distinctively and proudly trains um, on people um, for ways that are um, um, apart from the entire system of Silicon Valley here, which is important and has produced incredible things, uh, but too rarely in my judgment these days, people acquire those skills and use them for, for uh, explicitly civic purposes. So um, to introduce Minister Tang, uh, a minister without portfolio in the government of Taiwan, um, worked for a number of years, as I understand it, never here, um, physically located in Silicon Valley for Apple, um, uh, but it ha has done, you've done all kinds of things um, in technology, uh, um, including working within some of the companies that everyone here, um, in fact, everyone across the world are familiar with. And you've been in office now in Taiwan for, let me see if I got this right, um, for about five years? Five years. Okay, super. All right. Um, with that, I want to begin in the spirit of my introduction by talking about a phrase which I gather you've used about yourself, um, that you consider yourself a kind of civic hacker. That's right. Mm -hmm. I have in mind here thinking particularly about the students in the class as a way of suggesting, I've seen you describe democracy as a, a technology itself, a technology. Uh, a type of technology, yes. type of technology, mm -hmm. right, a form of social mm -hmm. organization for decision making mm -hmm. with equal voice. Mm -hmm. Civic hacking as a way to support the efforts, perhaps, uh, of, of civic spaces as well as democratic institutions. Yep. Um, you know, the names that everyone in, 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 at Stanford are familiar with are the, the founders and the dropouts um, who go on to found the large companies. Um, and another hero of mine is Aaron Swartz, um, a kind of you know, leader of the open software movement that I'm sure you're aware of. But too few, too too infrequently, people look. Um, people at Stanford look to people like you doing civic work. Um, so I, I wanted to ask just if you could give a capsule summary about the path from acquiring the technical skills that you have 
to deciding to devote devote yourself with those skills to civic purposes rather than to you know um, disruption within the marketplace. Certainly. Um, so uh, I think the journey for me began truly uh, when I was 14 years old. Uh, that was 1995. Uh, and uh, I discovered this new thing, then new thing called the World Wide Web, uh, and told my teachers that my textbooks were out of date because knowledge was being created. Uh, and I'm part of this knowledge creating process. Well, I, I'm really just offering free spell checking uh, services to people who pre preprint uh, publishers on uh, archive.org, A-R-X-I-V, you know, the Cornell thing, uh, that uh, was actually, well, it's still around, so a very large um, enterprise by now. It is spawned like BioArchive and many other archives after that, right? So, um, yeah, I was offering free spell checking services, just writing uh, to the preprint authors uh, with the suggestions to uh, fix typos or something. And they over the internet, they didn't know I was just 14 years old. Uh, and so uh, they considered me their, their peers, and we were able to have like real conversations uh, over email and so on. So I took those printouts uh, to the head of my school. Um, my principal uh, and said, you know, uh, you, you told me that I have to finish uh, the high school and then get a good degree, maybe uh, pass some GRE test and get into a good university college uh, and maybe be a postdoc before doing all this. But I'm already doing all this. So, um, you know, uh, why, why would I um, spend time on, on your school? Um, and the head of the principal uh, really liked the confrontational style, actually. And she, after looking at the email printouts, uh, considered for a minute and said, okay, from tomorrow on, you don't have to go to my school anymore. Uh, and I'm like, what about compulsory education? And she's like, oh, I'll cover for you, which means that she faked the records. Um, yeah. and so, <laughs> so, so I as began um, like uh, autonomous learning uh, right then and uh, started a few companies and each one after another exploring this idea of how people come to a swift trust uh, over the internet and how the internet can very quickly connect people and also the dangers of some parts of social interaction that makes people lose trust with each other as easily, actually much more easily than in face-to-face -face settings online. Uh, and so social interaction design was uh, definitely uh, my uh, main line of work. Uh, and so that brought me to the Silicon Valley uh, and building more pro-social rather than anti-social uh, social networks and also brought me to the Sunflower Occupy where we occupied the parliament for three weeks with half a million people on the street and many more online to deliver a trade deal, uh, but using uh, listening as skill, facilitated conversation, open space technology look technology right which is a social technology nonviolent yeah. communication and this digital counterpart we did uh, arrive on a very coherent set of demands uh, which was then agreed in 2014 by the head of the parliament and ever after that we were hired then as uh, reverse mentors uh, to the cabinet then in end of 2014 and after I guess a couple of years of apprenticeship uh, the civil uh, service just considered this to be a good idea overall uh, and so I'm hired a full-time promoter from in turn to a full minister at large, uh, and then uh, starting to work with mimetic producers in each and every ministry. We've got hundreds of people now, participation officers that lives with cute companion animals mm -hmm. and translates uh, like communication material, like physical distancing when you're outdoor, keep two of those shivas away or wear a mask. And if you're indoor, keep three of them uh, away. And our idea of, you know, wearing mask is so that you don't put your, um, you know, feet to your mask, well, hand to your mouth and uh, don't do what this dog does with this uh, rational uh, self-interest, right? But uh, communicated in a way that five years old and uh, 70 years old I'd like would very much willingly share. Uh, and so it has a more uh, higher R value than, I don't know, respect the elderly uh, kind of messages and so on. So so that brought me to this uh, pro-social messaging part, uh, which is more like a trainer-trainer network so that each and every ministry and agency now uh, gains this idea to to listen as skill uh, using the cute uh, dogs and also occasionally cats. Yeah, um, looking at the what you just showed us on on your on your 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 iPad or whatever device mm -hmm. that was. That's uh, an iPad. Uh -huh. uh, reminds mm -hmm. me that you know so I I also um, from seeing some of your presentations um, mm -hmm. online in the past, I I formed the impression that you believe that either some form of humor or play. Um, mm -hmm. A playfulness, a, a kind of humorous orientation, mm -hmm. is important to the delivery of technological services, and, and in particular in government. I think you know very few people here in the United States associate playfulness or humor with with mm -hmm. public services. Yep. Um, 
um, can you say a little bit about um, uh, uh, about how that plays a role in in thinking um, through your own delivery of public services in Taiwan? Yeah, I saw this slide of question. Uh, is uh, literally a uh, humor over rumor, uh, which yep. is uh, some some poetry right there. So anyway, the, the humor over rumor, the, the fast, fair, fun uh, idea of communication basically says, uh, so in Taiwan, uh, we still remember the martial law. We, we've had the longest martial law in any uh, country in the planet. So we don't want to go back there. We don't want to go back to the white terror, right? So um, people could not even fathom the idea of a otherwise would be reasonable, um, like administrative takedown, uh, for example, in, the, uh, in Germany, Germany, uh, they consider it reasonable to tell the largest internet platforms to do a takedown if hate speech is involved, right? In, in Thailand, is about uh, royalty and the image of the royalty. So each country or each jurisdiction has some ideas like for, for this particular part of speech, it's not enough to just to address the damage later. It's actually necessary uh, to do censorship and takedown for these very specific things. Um, in, in the US, it uh, used to be about uh, patent and trade secret and copyright violations, but I see that that um, part has been relaxed a little bit. Anyway, so so the point is that each jurisdiction has its uh, things that's worth taking taking out, right? Uh, taking down, and in Taiwan, none. So so because of our very strong uh, investment to the martial uh, law era uh, regimes uh, of authoritarianism, uh, of the guard against authoritarianism, anytime anyone says something uh, that's uh, a takedown, uh, like I don't know, sci-hub, right? Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then even considering a administrative takedown is a, is a non-starter, which is why uh, Sci-Hub lived uh, happily as a .tw domain for quite a while uh, <laughs> before other administrative reasons took them down, uh, not our uh, government's work. Uh, and uh, so because of that, when we see a pretty damaging uh, viral disinformation that attacked the election integrity uh, right. of accusing a, a like, bad counts, a uh, bad tally, or uh, public health related disinformation uh, that uh, sells um, like a purpose to sell mask, but actually uh, sells computer virus uh, instead if you do uh, try to purchase and so on. These are these are um, like downright criminal, uh, but even for that, we can't uh, even fathom a kind of censorship or takedown that other regimes uh, would uh, perfectly reasonably consider. So we have to investigate what's the um, was the reason of the higher than one basic uh, reproduction value, the, the basic R value of those disinformation, because if it doesn't spread, it doesn't really cause damage, right? Uh, right. And we discovered that it's really about outrage. Uh, it's really about a emotion of something injustice is happening and that people would want to highlight it. And while they get into this mood of outrage, they don't bother to fact check. And so that gets very easily connected to uh, the idea of discrimination or the idea of revenge, or not the idea of the affect the feeling of such uh, antisocial feelings. And when people are in those states, uh, there's no media competence to speak of. And so uh, then we start to ask, what's the vaccine? What's the antidote of the mind? Yeah. And it turns out it's humor. If you have left about something, then it channels the energy in the outrage into co-creation, into creativity, into a, a sense of playfulness. Uh, this is like a, a transitional space uh, on the internet that makes people's uh, imagination and into a more pro-social dimension. And so uh, we now have this um, re really teams of comedians that's just rose out whenever we detect there's a rising, trending uh, misinformation. Um, at any given time, there may be just three because the total mental bandwidth <laughs> is limited uh, in a society. They also compete with one another like virus. Yeah. Uh, and so we roll out those uh, very fun uh, vaccines. Uh, and then that gets even more viral than the angry, uh, the disinformation, the outrage-based disinformation. And when people laugh about it, there's no going back. So, because this is a one-way street um, in people's right. minds. So that al allows us to uh, fight the uh, disinformation without a takedown, uh, much like we fight, uh, I don't know, the pandemic with no lockdown. Yeah, so, well, so let me, can I just verify? Uh, um, so the, the government of Taiwan has comedians uh, on the yes. payroll for this yes. purpose? Yes, definitely. definitely. Very well paid, very well paid. Amazing. Okay. Um, well, I want to use that as a bridge now to ask you some questions. Like maybe this is going to be your answer: fight with humor. But you know, we've we've covered in class the issues of free speech online, content moderation strategies, how the First Amendment interacts in the United States setting with with such questions. 
First Amendment, of course, makes it difficult to, to carry out here what you described in Germany in certain respects, although other democratic societies have lots of, lots of um, you know, different ways of, of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've lived through here in the U.S. just recently um, the takedown of, of Donald Trump from Twitter and, and Facebook. Um, uh, if you were either um, employed by the U.S. government or employed by Twitter or, or Facebook, um, what would you have done on January 6th and January 7th about Donald Trump, Donald Trump's tweets or, or posts? And independent of that particular case, I'd love to hear like guidance or advice from your perspective to people in Silicon Valley with respect to content moderation. Right. Uh, so uh, we, we had in January 2020, uh, our presidential election, almost uh, exactly the same conspiracy theory <laughs> that was uh, spread uh, and although it's addressed differently and so it has different uh, results and i think it, it really is worth uh, sharing so for example uh, right before the the election uh, around the end of 2019 one of the most uh, trending piece of disinformation and i quote is um well the words are probably not legible, so I'll just read, uh, quote, Hong Kong thugs compensation exposed, killing a police owns these teenagers up to 20 million. So and was a rather scary looking uh, young protesters uh, image. Yeah. And, and that's because uh, that was shaping to be the deciding factor in our presidential election, uh, January 2020. Uh, so this is a Reuters photo. Uh, that photo actually is genuine. Uh, but the original caption only said there's teenage protesters seen during the march. Uh, end of story, right? So, so this, um, this alternate reality caption, uh, this uh, something talk about this 13 year old that bought new iPhones and recruiting his brothers. Uh, it's entirely made up. Uh, it's intentional misinformation, which means it's disinformation. Uh, but we didn't take anything down. We used, as I mentioned, uh, the regime called notice and public notice, which is like the Canadian co copyright enforcement system, notice and notice, uh, except it's on public notice. Yes. So uh, first, the uh, um, people who uh, use the uh, line, which is like WhatsApp and to an encrypted chat channels, they uh, flag the early warnings by uh, long pressing a message and this message and flagging as spun. Uh, and then when they do that, just like when you're uh, flagging your inbox as spam, it sends signals uh, to spam house and in our case to international fact checking network or the COFAX uh, project from the Gov Zero community so that people see which uh, ideas uh, are trending. Uh, and then uh, we um, made uh, this deal uh, with all the uh, leading um, social media, starting with the Taiwanese domestic uh, pro-social social media called the PTT. Uh, which is a National Taiwan University student pet project that's been running for 25 years with no advertisers or shareholders. Uh, it still remains a national university subsidized by the government um, pet project, uh, open source, co-governed, uh, all that. And and so they don't have shareholder values. When they go <laughs> to report, and they're, they're very happy to do notice in public notice. And with the social norm uh, firmly in place, we then negotiate with Facebook and the like so that they also do uh, notice and public notice uh, for, uh, for example, the transparency around uh, campaign donations and advertisement during election and so on. Uh, and so this is no uh, different uh, when the fact checkers discovered that this uh, alternate reality caption was uh, indeed first seen in Zhongyang Zhen Fa Wei Chang An Jian, the Weibo account of the uh, communist uh, Chinese, um, you know, central law and political unit, uh, their state propaganda unit, uh, then uh, everyone who shared this on any social media platforms immediately shares it, but with a mandatory frame that says right. this is proudly sponsored by the Communist Party, maybe not proudly, sponsored right. by the state organ of the Communist Party uh, and probably also violating Reuters copyright. Um, and so because of that, anyone who shared this becomes a vector of sharing the clarification and sharing the vector of the frame also. So people learn about it. They learn about how to be more media competent, not just media literate, because uh, when you say have this notice in public notice, you can also generate your own narrative uh, based on that. So you later on, when you see, for example, on also January 2020, literally the day of the election, um, there's another uh, rumor that says the CIA 
make mm -hmm. two invisible inks. Uh, so no matter which uh, person you vote, this uh, you know um, CIA special ink, make sure Dr. Tsai's uh, ballot always appears uh, during the counting and whatever uh, a candidate you vote, those ink will disappear. Uh, basically it's an assault on the democratic process uh, yeah. itself. And we solved that very um, simply by inviting, and we've been doing that for close to a decade now, wow, uh, to, to invite the YouTubers of all different parties uh, to go into the counting process arbitrarily close to the counting uh, yeah. stations, and then they can film uh, the entire process. And each major party have these uh, custom developed apps where they did the counting during the um, official counting. So they they have a unofficial count, but from each and every major parties, uh, even during the counting process. And we use paper only counting, paper only ballots, which means that uh, it's very much verifiable if there are invisible inks, there's no way that it's escaping the YouTuber's eyes. Um, and so the, the point here is that if, um, if people don't believe the opposition party's YouTubers, most of them don't, they do believe their own party's YouTubers. And when right. those YouTubers report the same count, people don't uh, buy into this invisible ink story anyway, right? So this is radical transparency and participatory accountability, inclusive accountability. Anyone can be a auditor in the sense of that. That's so we see this rumor uh, goes up and then once the YouTubers numbers start to agree with them and people get uh, their uh, count from their favorite party members, then this goes down again. So mm -hmm. I would say that whatever happened in the US was more of a symptom of these systems not in place. Yes. Um, and, and that's my take. All right, that, uh, super interesting. So let me expand from that and, and ask one last question before we open it up and take some sure. questions from Slido. Mm -hmm. um, um, Mark Andreessen wrote a, a widely noted, I guess it was a blog post um, about a year ago or just shy of a year ago, basically saying, you know, it's, it's time to build. And um, at least what I inferred he meant by that was that it's time for entrepreneurs to come to the fore again and build companies in creative ways that you know, get beyond the great stagnation. You know, we wanted flying cars and we got 140 characters instead, a kind of exhortation to the software um, geniuses at Stanford and beyond to create the new the new generation of companies. Um, if you were able to give a similar exhortation to the talent at Stanford University and beyond about um, what they should be building or what they should be doing if not building, I'm curious, what's, what software do we need to support rather than subvert democratic institutions? What types of career pathways do we need um, for people at Stanford and beyond so that um, social systems and individuals thrive rather than being threatened by the current or um, kind of landscape of, of big tech. Well, I'm just free associating here because I am seeing um, your face in the middle and a, a circle of students and each name with a mute button, uh, mute icon next to them. And so uh, my free association when uh, hearing your question is that maybe you, you know, uh, unmute yourself and unmute others, uh, like literally give voice uh, to, to people. And, and I think um, that this idea of democracy as a type of technology is, is really about increasing the, the bit rate uh, because uh, in traditional way of thinking about democracy, each of us get three bits every four years per person of upload, mm -hmm. and that's it, uh, co-voting. Uh, and uh, in other times, we're, we're muted, right? Or we're literally muted. Uh, and there's really no way for us to set the agenda. I mean, we may answer a online poll or a SMS poll or a survey call uh, from, from, you know, be part of focus group or whatever, but but we're, we're anonymous there, right? We're just aggregated uh, data to the democratic process. And the, um, the commercial world uh, and the social sector have all developed ways of co-creation. I'm thinking about crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, and many uh, like now staples already infrastructures <laughs> of the, the whole creative process to get uh, your customers to be not just customers, but essentially your partners in co-creation. And so um, people would pivot their ideas very quickly. Um, I think that idea came from Stanford, actually. Pivot their idea very quickly when their uh, stakeholders discover a better way of doing things. But the government, because of the limited bandwidth 
of the democratic process couldn't do so um, until four years or two years down the line, right? So, so my um, uh, invitation really uh, is to think of democracy as a, um, a bitrate constrained process and work on ways to empower the voiceless. Just as in Taiwan, your national participation platform, already more than one quarter of uh, the 10 million or so visitors uh, per year in the country with 23 million, a lot of people. Uh, the initiatives, uh, more than a quarter, are from people who are not even 18 years old, who are still in the basic education um, schools and so on. And because of that, they don't uh, get this idea that I need to mute myself until I'm 18 years old and therefore matter to the civic process. Anyone who's like six years old, uh, 12 years old, they all raise perfectly good um, citizens' initiatives, especially around sustainability because they are on the business end of climate change. And when we empower these people more, uh, they uh, will probably not uh, strike and go to street on Fridays, but they effect real change. Yeah. Hmm. All right, um, let's move over to Slido. Ryan, uh, we have, we're a small enough group here that I'm just gonna invite you to unmute yourself. Um, yes, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. That's the call to action, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, hi, Audrey, uh, thanks hey. so much. Yeah, so I was just reading some things. I, I also saw a podcast or a part of an episode of a TEDx technology podcast mm -hmm. that you recorded mm -hmm. once um, on mm -hmm. sort of the like uh, information campaign in Taiwan, um, yeah. but I was, I don't know, this question is more for you personally, like, mm -hmm. where did your, I guess, like, transparency idea for government come from? Like, I guess, mm -hmm. maybe what were you reading or who you were listening or talking to? Mm -hmm. um, and then also, aside from just government, how could, how might this help companies such as like mm -hmm. Google or Facebook, especially when it comes to user data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Personally, um, I participated in internet governance, as I mentioned, when I was just uh, 14 or 15 years old. Across the internet, nobody knew I was just 14, right? Uh, and, and so uh, I, I work on, on technologies such as uh, the, the Atom technology, who's a successor of the RSS or alternative to the RSS system to connect the, the blocks uh, together and so on. So in that case, I'm working on what uh, Aaron Schwarz and others have created and bring it into a more real-time uh, publication subscription and so on. And I discovered that really in the blogosphere or uh, in the um, Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, which is where we're doing the standard making, um, nobody can force anyone to do anything, right? <laughs> the Internet Society doesn't have an army <laughs> or, or a, a navy for that matter. So uh, all we have is transparency, is rough consensus and running code and making the process transparent so people, if they are negatively affected, can get uh, uh, that's addressed uh, immediately and when nobody feel that this will hurt them or we can at least all live with it uh, then we literally hum right uh, either in the same space or on the uh, mailing list we literally hum uh, our consensus a uh, rough consensus into action and then we go go and develop our own coach and so uh, this to to me seems to say that if the transparency is inclusive that is to say anyone who could get negatively affected and has an email address uh, could join the decision-making process. That, and if nobody can force anyone to, to do anything, then uh, by definition, by default, uh, it works toward the common good. It avoids the tragedy of commons and is more likely to avoid a tragedy of horizons because uh, the people who rep represent the future generation's interest because it's not a voting process, they could also get their idea, more nuanced, eclectic ideas into the mix and into the rough consensus setting. So I would say that I learned it personally from internet governance. Now, uh, for corporations, I think that also helps a lot because we're now in an era of stakeholder capitalism. Uh, we are seeing now in the uh, some parts of the world, um, like Taiwan and the part you're in, uh, the, the, especially young people, but more and more consumers are not satisfied of the companies just doing uh, their, their like minimally um, efforts to avoid polluting the environment or polluting the society. Um, nowadays in Taiwan, people consider the company that do nothing to be proud of the problem, and they demand to see uh, where they are uh, in in the you know solution to, for example, reducing carbon footprint among other things. Um, also, uh, reducing conspiracy theory uh, footprint in that case <laughs> of the more anti-social social media. So, uh, because of that, any company that is not transparent uh, with the customers um, probably face 
more a higher chance of a social boycott uh, or social sanction. Uh, and the only way to turn the co-creation energy of your customers um, with uh, your leadership team and so on is to be uh, basically the same as the open government principle, to be inclusively transparent and also invite participatory accountability. All right, there are uh, a bunch of other questions that are anonymous. We're going to come to those in a minute. But uh, Bhagarath, uh, uh, I've got a que question from you, um, actually a couple of them. But why don't you just unmute if you're willing and, and, and um, ask your question to the minister? Sure. Hi, Minister Chang. It's so great to be with you. Uh, I had a question on just um, like, what, what are some lessons you can share with us about successfully integrating technology with government? And what are like some of the challenges you have faced and how, how did you overcome them? Because here there's tons of regulation and sometimes bureaucracy can be slow. So I was speaking with the uh, former chief data scientist of the U.S., uh, DJ Patil, and he, he mentioned how it can be challenging to navigate through all of that. So I was just wondering, um, what, what do you think helped you become uh, successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the career public service can be slow, uh, but it also could be really fast. Uh, and the <clears throat> the tempo, the, the iteration uh, in agile uh, speech, the, the length of the sprint uh, or the scrum uh, is is where it's mattering. Uh, so uh, personally, I uh, hold my office hours to social innovators uh, in Taiwan every Wednesday. Uh, so what I'm doing is essentially improving the the kind of uh, bandwidth with uh, from social innovators anywhere in Taiwan uh, with the career public service by bringing out fresh ideas every Wednesday, which means that after this uh, video conference, I'm off to the social innovation lab, uh, which is my office. And the office is uh, itself co-created with the leading social innovators uh, in, in Taiwan uh, and beyond. So this is my, my office, like literally. And the soccer field here is by people with Down syndrome, uh, who turns out not uh, are only uh, good in baking Bakery. Uh, they're very famous bakers, but also in Taiwan, and but also very good at creating art. So they just draw whatever they see, and it's like the, the lens of uh, Van Gogh's eyes, and people automatically become more creative when they step into this place with pretty good music, pretty good food, and, and things like that. And I do uh, bring in these ideas, but I don't command anyone in my office uh, in the space to, to realize it. For people who are in the public digital innovation space, uh, my uh, office, if you check out digitalministry.tw, you see the, the people, um, there are secondments from um, pretty much half of the ministries, so more than 12 ministries have sent secondments or dispatches to my office and they're all career public service but they don't report to me. Uh, I don't order them to do anything. They don't give me orders. All I ask is that we work out loud. We use a Kanban board, uh, started physically but now the office <laughs> has like 20 staff and 30 um, interns and um, you know many uh, the network of comedians and participation offices, more than 100 people in total we can't use physical campaigns anymore so we would send it online uh, but and nevertheless the spirit is that we just have fun and share food uh, every week on a weekly basis incorporate those social innovation ideas into visible um, things and for the career public service uh, station in my office they know that first of all I absorb all the risk if things go wrong if we had to pivot it's all Audrey's fault so, so they, they are happy about proposing genuinely new ideas, sometimes anonymously through Slido, actually. Um, and also, it saves time. Uh, for uh, most of the bureaucracy, they're uh, wary about implementing something that saves their time, but uh, actually wastes people's time, other the citizens uh, during the process if they're not familiar with it, it or uh, some other departments which will absorb the time cost or, or the um, like like the retraining cost and so on. So they're very conservative uh, in the innovation that they deploy, but because uh, pretty much all the 12 uh, people facing um, bureaucrats are already in my office, office. So whenever they hear something from a video conference call with a remote area and so on, uh, they don't say, oh, I have to check with the Ministry of Interior. The Ministry of Interior dispatch is sitting right next to them. I have to check with the Ministry of Health and Welfare because they're sitting right next to them. Uh, and, so, <clears throat> and so because of that, they were able to, uh, in a facilitated conversation, get to the rough consensus about, okay, this seems that uh, nobody is losing from it. And because uh, every other ministry's dispatch, even if they're not related to it, they can also uh, play on-site customer because we're all citizens ourselves, right? So if people get a rough consensus, then it's likely to save everyone's time. And for ideas that 
reduce everyone's risk and save everyone's time. The career public service is very fast in implementing it. That they're like, oh, why don't we get it done yesterday? Uh, and so that's then improve the mutual trust because it improves the feedback cycle, the speed uh, from people calling into uh, the, the office or the hotline uh, saying, hey, um, I don't know, I invented a new method of um, using traditional rice cooker to cure the virus, but does it destroy the mosque? And that get amplified immediately. We make a creative film of me cooking the, the mosques. Uh, dry steaming uh, without adding waters uh, or, or a, a young uh, boy calling saying you're rationing our mask and all I get was those pink medical masks all the boy in my class have navy blue surgical grade mask and I don't want to wear pink to school well then we talked to the participation officer the person who lived with that cute dog and they made a suggestion and lo and behold uh, the next day on um, 2 p.m. all the medical officers uh, in the central epidemic command center regardless of gender wore pink uh, and uh, with pink medical mask and and, and all and it became really sensational all the all the leading brands um then just changed their social media profiles pink uh and i think our minister of health even said that pink panther was a childhood hero uh and so the young boy became the most hit boy in the class where only he has the color that heroes wear and i guess the hero's hero wear uh, and so on and so because of this it massively increased the mutual trust and then we get more fresh ideas from the civil uh servants um as anonymously on on slide sometimes and also from the social innovators all right, so you're, you're, you're painting for us this kind of wondrous picture of, of radical inclusivity and participatory mm -hmm. governance and, and openness and transparency, mm -hmm. um, a, a playfulness and humor written into it, comedians on, on the staff just as important mm -hmm. as other civil servants. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of the anonymous questions on Slido next on, on my screen ask questions, again, to put, you know, just as you call democracy a form of a technology, and we're looking at the bit rate uh, of participation. Um, well, you know, American democracy is, is at a much greater scale than Taiwanese democracy. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, I don't know, 12 or 15x the size in terms of the population. Mm -hmm. Scale, in, in many respects, introduces new problems in, into the mix. Um, and I wonder if you think the kinds of things you've accomplished in Taiwan would translate more or less smoothly or cleanly into an American context, mm -hmm. given the scale? Or is there something different about the scale of American democracy? Take the question that's asked about trust in particular um, as, a, as a different kind of challenge that you would need to rethink if you were uh, you know, in these in these quarters, rather than where you are in Taiwan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, the population of, of say New New Jersey uh, is one one third uh, of Taiwan, and California is just uh, I think slightly more people. Right, we have twenty three, twenty four million. California is what thirty nine million, um, and, and so we're on comparable uh, scales, uh, is what I'm saying. Because um, to work across uh, different time zones is 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 difficult as. Uh, like proven today, uh, and and people who live in different time zones, there's less chance of uh, real time interaction, right? Yeah. So uh, I think for uh, uh, this cross time zone conversation, uh, the ideas of maybe something like immersive virtual or augmented reality uh, is probably needed if you want to people to uh, feel this kind of empathy in real time uh, across time zones. But within the same time zone, it's always much easier. And I think that the two uh, foundational requirements, one is broadband as human rights, universal broadband in, in Taiwan. Even if you're on the tip of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, the Jade Mountain or the Saviya uh, or Pendagunong, uh, you know, indigenous languages, uh, all these uh, uh, interpretations uh, could get a full live streaming uh, when people go to the top of Taiwan because they know they have 10 megabits per second both ways for just 16 euros um, per, per month, unlimited data. And they know that if they don't, it's my fault, they can actually call me. So <laughs> this is a, a solemn guarantee that we, we use, you know, helicopters, uh, spectrum auction methods, whatever, to, to make sure that everyone has universal broadband access. Because otherwise, when we introduce these mechanisms, we're, we're essentially leaving people behind. We're excluding them from the democracy where, where you're immune people who were previously unmuted and, and that's unthinkable uh, and so that's the first thing and the second as I uh, alluded to is the idea of digital competence uh, we, we don't teach media literacy 
uh, anymore. <laughs> we teach media competence, the same for data and digital competence, meaning that the young people are not just a consumer, uh, which they uh, had to remain consumer until they're 18 years old, but rather uh, they're, they're already producers of narratives. They fact check um, the, the presidential uh, debates and forums. They make uh, their own environmental sensing uh, machines, uh, the PM2.5 sensing machines in particular called Airbox, uh, where it's pretty standard actually in the uh, primary school um, curriculum. So each and every dot you see here is some uh, primary schooler uh, and their teachers contributing to a um, distributed ledger that measures the, the sensing the environment uh, in real time. And, and really to me, there's no other way to teach about data stewardship, uh, about bias, about um, the idea of a feedback cycle of stakeholder uh, of data and so on, data pipeline uh, and so on without uh, people actually participating in the production and the narrative making of data so that's our primary school education so so with data and media competence and with problem as human rights I don't I, I think this is remarkably scale free um, if people and well with overlapping time zones <laughs> then we can get overlapping consensus uh-huh fantastic uh, um, I will confess that that sounds almost too good to be true um, mm -hmm. for the Socratic orientation in me, but I'm going to... Well, well we're, we're in the future, right? Like full 12 hours. That's true. That's true. And it's distributed unevenly as the <laughs> as the Institute for the Future said uh, here right. in Palo Alto. Um, <laughs> well done. Um, we've got some more questions on Slido, but you know, with folks here, there is a hand raising function. So if you, if you have a question for Minister Tang, don't be shy about raising your hand right now. Let's go over back to Slido in the meantime. And, um, you know, I, I, the, the issues of um, radical transparency of openness um, seem also to bump up against conventional concerns about data privacy. We've covered those in the class a, a good deal. Um, I wonder if you can say how you, how you square that circle. Um, how on the one hand, with, with media competence um, that you're just describing, radical forms of transparency in inclusive ways, do you nevertheless find ways to protect um, 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 data and, and ownership even for parts of people's digital lives that they don't necessarily want to be open and transparent to others? Certainly. So when we are in the public square, uh, whatever we contribute to the commons are voluntary. Uh, and in the social innovation lab, which I showed you a, a minute ago, uh, people come to my office out with the understanding that everything what I said to them will be on public record. However, if they relate something about a power imbalance uh, in their work, or they saw something wrong, uh, and they tell an anecdote about their friends who uh, wish to remain anonymous, and so on, I fully respect their wishes. So while it's true that we published the entire transcript uh, to the, the internet, uh, I think the say it uh, function uh, is the, the I'm just pasting a link here. Uh, you yeah. can see that after I become digital minister, I've held uh, 1,600 meetings with 6,000 people in 300,000 uh, speeches. Uh, nevertheless, if the people wish to remain anonymous and or if they wish to uh, just censor themselves, whatever they said, in extreme cases, uh, the transcript become a monologue of just me talking. Uh, and people can take out any part of it that pertains to, say, privacy or trade secrets or, or whatever uh, else. So this link in particular is a conversation with the senior leadership team of Microsoft with all the usual suspects and they uh, want to protect their privacy uh, I guess because they're a privacy conscious uh, company or something uh, and so they decide to, to censor everything that is said from the senior leadership team but you still have this one side transcript from, from my side so you can still um, like sus out whatever they have asked uh, but it in no way compromise uh, this review zero bits of their information because I um, give my visitors 10 days to to just scrub uh, the transcript so if they notice some part of my speech um, that uh, reveals their their uh, trade secret or private details they can tell me and I'll always reframe that uh, so that it becomes non-identifying let me just push one more dimension on that so I understand the the principle there about when, when people show up in a in a public or a, you know in an interaction with you in your capacity as minister these are um, strong expectations about uh, um, um, transparency for citizens mm -hmm. to inspect what you do and to be able to participate uh, in ways with equal, equal information flows. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, you know, it's often sometimes said that for COVID responses, for example, mm -hmm. that the, 
the expectations of either freedom or privacy here mm -hmm. about employers or companies or worse, the government surveilling us for the sake of public health spills over into other forms of surveillance, Edward Snowden style, and in that respect, you know, undermines our liberty and compromises our privacy, even when there is a public warrant for it. So, so what I want to push on is just to get you to say something more specifically about if you see trade-offs or tensions, is, it, does Taiwan or in your head, do you simply weight the interests of the public over uh, in, in more heavily than the interests of, pro of individuals to determine for themselves what they want to share and what they don't, whether it's for the COVID response or for the purposes you were describing? Or do you think that it, it's not a it's not just a weighing of the of the values or a different balance, but but you there's a you know a, an understanding about public and private that's different from what I've described. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I don't think it's a a trade off uh, because if you frame it as a trade off, there's there's no winner. It's essentially a no win uh, situation. I think Ben Franklin says something about that, right? Deserving neither liberty or safety. Uh, yeah. and so and and so what what uh, the Taiwan model shows uh, essentially is that basically liberty is a form of um, like self-expression and privacy is um, respected when everyone who voluntarily participate in a um, social relationship or transaction um, gets uh, probably the same or overlapping norms and just act within those norms. Uh, and so just one concrete example uh, of during COVID, uh, we did what we call participatory self-surveillance uh, that doesn't require the state or the capitalist <coughs> to be the all-seeing eye, right? Uh, and so uh, in Taiwan, we require people to uh, register to the business uh, they uh, visited um, their contact so that when a local outbreak happens, we know who to contact uh, with the contact tracing. Now, um, we didn't communicate that uh, very well, I guess, because uh, I, I, back in last April, uh, there is a um, professional um, hostess in the hostess bar, uh, part of a nightlife district uh, that gets diagnosed. But on the first day, she didn't want to uh, review the contact numbers for the fear that her uh, patrons will be <clears throat> re-identified, which would violate the privacy norm uh, in those uh, parts of the nightlife district. Um, and, and this is a classic trade-off situation. Yes. And, and Taiwan is not the, the only jurisdiction facing that. Pretty much the same week, uh, Japan is facing the same thing. And later on, Korea faces the same thing. Um, but uh, our response is very different. Instead of threatening to put people in jail uh, or fining the business um, or ordering them to, to close and essentially driven them underground as some other jurisdiction did, uh, the US did during prohibition <laughs> and, and fostered the, the unaccountable underground uh, economy uh, and, and therefore have a lose-lose situation, uh, we instead uh, invited, uh, basically publicly challenged without imposing prison or fine, um, saying that, you know, uh, all we need is a way to contact people. So we don't really care who they are. And also we don't want their contact numbers. The business owners can retain those. So they brainstormed and in just a couple of weeks adjusted to basically have scratch pads. So anyone visiting uh, the night nightclubs and or whatever um, have to maybe get a prepay SIM card, maybe a throw away uh, proton mail or whatever email address. Uh, and they file that in, make sure they could be contacted, but that's between the business Business owner and them and nothing more uh, and they keep those uh, shards of papers um, like literally 28 days uh, or four weeks and after no outbreak for those four weeks uh, they shred uh, whatever that was 28 so it's like a one-time path but it's not really a one-time path <laughs> but you can think of that way uh, and so because of that uh, what, what we're seeing is that it preserved the privacy norm there because the patrons understand this will not get aggregated by the state or the local government it would not get into uh, you know the the uh, surveillance capitalism world, uh, which will be really bad for the people who frequent there. Um, and so because of that, uh, they become part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, and then the nightclubs and the drinking pubs and whatever gradually reopened after just a few short weeks uh, after they invented this way of what we call a real contact system. This is just one anecdote, but there is a philosophy behind it. This is basically saying privacy is about norms. Uh, norms uh, are good for co-creation. And if we involve the people who participate, including hosts and hostesses in the hostess boss, then they do the right thing. But if you you give no trust, you, well, you get no trust. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I myself have never been to Taiwan, but, but um, um, hearing you describe it now, you know, puts it even higher atop my, 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 my wish list to experience because what you sound so, what you describe sounds so fantastical from an American mm -hmm. perspective with um, not merely are there issues of, you know, lack of compliance with contact tracing, but merely showing up in public with a mask, as of course, you mm -hmm. know, being reports um, was mm -hmm. a, a test. Mm -hmm. Technology here has often served to polarize society rather than to create norms of trust and co-creation. And um, reaching a point where playful, um, um, playful uh, settings of co-creation is the norm in public space among citizens um, sounds a, a happy distant future um, to, to, to this Socratic mm -hmm. person's uh, um, ears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I invite you to the future and check it out yourself. Uh, I paste this gold card link. You can apply it overseas and get uh, a free pass uh, to the Taiwan society even during the COVID. Okay. More, more than 2,000 people visited this way. Yeah. Well, it gets more wondrous um, every minute we speak, Mr. Minister Tang. Uh, <laughs> all right, um, we've got just under 10 minutes left. I want to make sure that other folks um, get a chance to interact personally with Minister Tang if, if they wish. So please raise your hand if you've got a question. I've got many more, but I've been the, the mouthpiece for the most part so far. Please get into the conversation. I'm going to leave a pregnant pause here for, for people to get in. I'm just making some instant coffee meanwhile. Mm -hmm. All right, there's a hand. Thena, go ahead. Hello, thank you so much for talking to us. It's a real pleasure. I was just wondering what you think or any examples that you can think of that is the worst possible way to deal with misinformation that you've seen here in the US. Hmm. Yeah, uh, really good question. It's a seminar topic. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, so um, what what I think uh, is feasible uh, and what we've seen in the more polarized um, democracies um, is to begin with things that are broadly speaking um, people could relate to. Uh, for example, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, they run a public consultation using Polis, the same uh, software we use to cross those rough consensus on the like of UberX or Airbnb quality, qualities. Um, so um, they make sure that uh, only the rough consensus, uh, the resonating ideas get uh, print, uh, get visibility rather than on the more antisocial corner of social media, which to me are like the nightlife district, you know, with addictive drinks and private balancers and uh, things like that. I mean, Facebook <laughs> and so on and trying to, to convert that into town square well no right tough luck so anyway so so the point is that um if you do have digital public infrastructure uh like polis and as evidenced by people in bowling green kentucky who uh, actually did a consultation with no preset topic so basically agenda setting instead of um, getting people to comment on a particular agenda and then you suspect you have an agenda um, you just begin saying uh, what about uh, a civic town hall that's um, really um, unconstrained uh, you just do do whatever uh, and then uh, people actually come to trust one another more because they could see no matter whether they identify as um, uh, Democrats or Republican or whatever they they all have the same priorities uh, in the Bowling Green um, Civic Assembly homepage, um, you can see that everybody cares about the art uh, in STEM education. So people see that um, the STEM need to become STEAM. Uh, and it's bipartisan, actually it's nonpartisan, it's transpartisan, meaning that everyone feels very strongly it need to be done yesterday. Uh, but people didn't know that they actually agreed uh, on those things uh, before. Um, they all um, care about universal broadband access, more uh, diversity, more choices in telecom operators in broadband suppliers. Again, that is a nonpartisan, transpartisan issue and so on. So once people 
will see the um, picture from Polis, uh, and this is the actual uh, Bowling Green picture. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the most important picture um, that people can see uh, during a democratic process. Um, so this picture looks like this, and then uh, this reads divisive statements. So the you know polarized ideological statements. This is a Bowling Green conversation, uh, and these are the rough consensus, like things that people probably agree on. And then sorted by the consensus, you see the concrete statements uh, that people do agree on, like STEAM education, like the diversifying of broadband access, uh, traffic flows shaping, and and like uh, it need to be improved, especially on the Scottsdale Road. Okay. Um, anyway, so <laughs> I'm just reading that report. <laughs> so so then people get into the feeling that uh, we are a polity after all. Uh, this uh, public uh, rough consensus get reflected to the people's uh, minds. And this uh, powerful picture, just like humor uh, triumph over rumor, this overrides people's self-identity of uh, thinking half of the population is somehow known people, right? Um, and so just getting them at, into this uh, coherent, um, blended, coherent volition moment uh, for, for a, a few times. And then people develop their own agency to work across the party or ideological differences. So that's this like cheap and cheerful, like no way of starting a, a public communication just talking about the traffic flow on Scottsfield Road. Yeah. Super. James, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Audrey. Oh, yes. Uh, my question is, how do you balance between um, automation and job security mm -hmm. in Taiwan? Right. Um, so in, in Taiwan, I call AI assistive intelligence, uh, just like I, I call collective intelligence CI. So they give us ACI, I guess, assisted collective intelligence. Um, and by, by saying assistive, uh, this means that we hold the same expectations as we will hold any human assistant, right? The, the basic ideas of alignment, um, like this glass actually showing me things more clearly rather than more blurry or pop-up advertisements, uh, goes without saying. <laughs> and accountability goes without saying when you frame it in an assistive way. Um, and so by framing this as ACI, what, what do our assistants do? Well, um, like Frances, I guess, <laughs> she helps making this communication possible, uh, enable human-to-human -human, um, communication, uh, connecting me to the people who otherwise I wouldn't have the bandwidth to, to communicate. And so basically a, a good um, human assistant, um, actually Frances is a professional diplomat from the uh, Foreign Service, so I'm just <laughs> kind of <laughs> I'm using this as an example and not really uh, saying that Foreign Service is some sort of AI. But anyway, <laughs> I'm trying to say is that <laughs> just like the, the foreign service does not um, take over uh, Ministry of Interior or really any other essential function of a state, but rather uh, in enable collaboration between previously less trusting parties, um, then uh, this makes uh, collective intelligence more possible. So if we frame AI this way, this is strictly speaking, improving the capability of people to co-create together, which needs a lot of amplification because we all have this wetware, uh, hot, coded uh, Dunbar's number that we don't function very well with more than 150 uh, strong links, right? So some sort of assistant intelligence needed anyway. Uh, video conferencing is actually one part of it, right? So so if we develop AI in our national ag agenda, in the AI ethics and so on, strictly uh, toward the visions of a assistive collective intelligence, then the ideas of uh, human replacement just, just go away because that's not what we're interested in. That's not what we spend taxpayer money to. We don't design incentive structures for corporations working on those uh, things that take uh, away job security and so on. All right. Well, we're a minute shy of 6 p.m. on Pacific time and, and I guess 9 a.m. at your time uh, in Taiwan. Um, on behalf of the entire group, uh, I want to express uh, our gratitude to you at, at an early hour of the morning for making mm -hmm. time for, for, uh, for us and for our questions. Um, as I said at the start, uh, you're an inspiration to me and, and I hope to, to many others um, on this call and in our class as well. Uh, I, I thank you so much, Minister Tang. It's been a delight uh, and, and so illuminating. Thank you. Uh, live long and prosper. Bye. <laughs> Bye.